summer, our news media was full of the news of the inversion in the yield curve of U.S. Treasury bills, an omen that in the past has heralded the coming of another recession. As a no-deal Brexit becomes increasingly likely, the U.S.-China trade war worsens, and central bankers are running out of space in their monetary policy, we indeed have some to worry about. Today, we will be discussing these issues, as well as the current and future role of the IMF. We are joined by the chief economist of the IMF, Professor Gita Gopinath. Next to her role as chief economist of the IMF, she is also the John Swanster Professor of International Studies and Economics at Harvard University. As always, we will have time in our interview for audience questions. So when the time arrives, please raise your hand and the mic will be brought to you. But for now, please help me in welcoming to our stage Professor Gita Gopinath. Welcome. Dr. Gopinath. Uh, Dr. Gopinath. Uh, welcome to Room for Discussion. It is a pleasure for us having you here. Before we delve into a very extensive conversation about the topics my colleague Luis just discussed, we're going to first focus on a more general question about your role in the IMF. What does the chief economist of the IMF do? Okay, so firstly, uh, Luis and Fabian, thank you so much <laughs> for uh, inviting me. This is my first time in this country. And actually, this is all I'm going to see before <laughs> I get on a plane again. Uh, but I would very much like to come back, uh, and hopefully soon. Uh, to your question of uh, what does the chief economist do, so I have two titles formally. I'm both the economic counselor, uh, and I am the director of the research department, uh, which means that on the second piece, we look at very important uh, policy issues of the day. Uh, we, we think about them very deeply. Uh, it forms the basis for some of the advice we give to countries uh, of our analysis of where the world economy is headed, how countries should prepare for it, uh, what necessary steps they should take at, this, uh, at any particular juncture. Uh, and then the other piece of being an economic counselor, which dovetails very closely with being the director of research, is uh, that we are thinking about uh, you know, we think of countries that come to us for financial assistance and programs, uh, you know, thinking about what the appropriate uh, policy package can be. Uh, when we have countries that want specific advice on particular issues, you know, uh, performing, providing advice on that front too. So I have engagements with management, with the executive board. Uh, so these are all multiple pieces of being yeah. uh, a chief economist. Um, talking about research, one of the most important research papers that the IMF uh, publishes is the World Economic Outlook. And in the last one, we saw that the topic of the trade war was one that was particularly giving a lot of attention. What are the effects of the trade war to America and China domestically? So, y so again, you're right. The research department puts out the World Economic Outlook, which is a document that we put out uh, numbers four, four times a year, and we're going to do the next one in October, so it's coming up soon. Uh, and as we've described the outlook for now, uh, global growth is sluggish, it's subdued, downside risks are high, and uh, though we are you know, uh, projecting a recovery in 2020, we see that as precarious. So when we think of downside risks, the trade tensions are number one yeah. uh, on, on, on the list of issues that we are uh, concerned about. These, these tensions started back in 2018. There was some sense in you know, April of this year that maybe that would come down, but if anything, that escalated yeah. further. And we've seen multiple rounds of tariffs being imposed uh, across countries between the US and China. So our estimate is that because of all the tariffs that have been announced between the US and China, uh, and so some of them have been implemented, some haven't. But if you take the whole host of them, that reduces the level of global GDP in 2020 by 0.8% relative to what it would have been in the absence of those tariffs. So these are significant effects on the global economy. Now, of course, China gets affected more than the U.S. does, but we're seeing the consequences uh, of that, the trade why tensions. Is that? Why does China feel the trade war harsher than the U.S.? For the simple reason that uh, China depends a lot more on uh, international trade yeah. for its growth. 
than the U.S. does. It's a much more open economy. It's much more reliant on, uh, on exports than the U.S. does. So that's, that would be uh, one important factor for it. Second, if you're an open economy and you rely more on trade and you enter into a, a, a trade uh, you know, dispute with another country, then you can have much bigger confidence effects on your business sector, and that's also been playing up. Well, we also know that the trade war is not only having effects on the United States and China, but it's also having spillover effects on its trading partners. What are, the, what are some of these effects that are, are, are spilling over from the trade war? Yeah, so when we look at our assessment um, of what the impact is of trade, there's a piece which is just the direct trade uh, channel, which is the fact that countries are buying less from each other. Uh, but the, the bigger effect that we have is on business sentiment. And so what you see here, and this is the current conjuncture that we have right now, if you want to think of the global outlook, which is that if you look at global trade, it's the weakest it's been since 2012. If you look at manufacturing, which is very closely related to international trade, if you look at investment, which is very closely related to international trade, that's where you see weakness across the globe. And it is because of tremendous uncertainty about where all of these trade uh, tensions are headed. But on the other hand, if you look at the services sector, that's holding up uh, you know, fairly well. So the, we're seeing this divergence, which tells us that the biggest concern on the global uh, outlook is about policy uncertainty, especially on the trade front. You mentioned that there is a lot of uncertainty, especially among investors. Uh, we have seen that in the reports, mostly speaking, this, this uncertainty is shown in long-term um, assets. Our question to you would be, what does this uncertainty mean for short-term capital flows? So there are, um, so, but, so firstly, uh, in terms of assets and asset valuations, right? I mean, it's, it's a good point to make, which is if you look at the stock market and look at stock prices, uh, they're at record highs in many countries of the world, despite this environment where we think there's tremendous policy uncertainty, despite this environment where if you look at earnings forecasts, those things don't look very, very positive. The simple answer to that is very low interest rates, yeah. right? We are in an environment with very accommodative financial conditions all over the world, and that's been playing a role. So again, to your question of short-term capital flows, and especially to emerging markets, I mean, those would be countries that are buffeted by these kinds of flows. They're exactly you know, struggling with this trade-off, which is on one hand, because of low interest rates around the world, because of easy financial market conditions, capital is tempted to flow to these markets. But whenever you see any uncertainty build up, or whenever you see any trade tension build up, then that has the opposite effect. So you are seeing capital flowing to these markets, but you know, in the absence of the trade uncertainty, I would expect even more would have gone in. Is this uncertainty also having an effect on global supply chains from the trade war? Are, are, are we seeing a diversion in trade as well? So we're certainly seeing a diversion in trade. So if you look at uh, trade between the US and China, that has come down. So both US and China are buying less from each other. You don't see much of a change in the trade balance between the US and China, uh, but you see both of them pulling back. But what you've seen is the diversion. So the US, instead of buying goods from China, is buying more from Mexico, is buying from Vietnam. That's where, the, that's where uh, you have seen a trade diversion. So you're certainly seeing that. Now, you know, often people ask the question is, are you actually seeing what looks like durable changes in global supply chains, which is of companies deciding to locate production now out of China and other parts of the world. Uh, I would say two things to that. One is that because as China has developed, uh, companies have decided to look for other locations in any case to locate production because it's becoming uh, more costlier to do business uh, in China. So there's some of that effect. But it's hard to see at this point whether the current trade tensions are generating durable changes in where you locate production. So uh, we don't have the data for it. Usually the data for that comes with the lag. Uh, and so we, we might have to wait a little bit for that. So you mentioned that countries like Mexico and Vietnam are exporting more to the United States. So there are some countries benefiting from this trade war. You certainly do have that. The trade diversion does that, indeed. Mm -hmm. And also, you also mentioned that the effects of this trade diversion, we are not so sure yet if it is durable. So if the trade war were to revert sort of to pre-2017, would we see a systemic risk developing in countries such as Vietnam and Mexico that have suddenly seen uh, a boost to their exports? 
I mean, they will certainly see some volatility in some of their economic indicators because there would be a shift back. There could be. Uh, but again, like I said, because some of these drivers of, of uh, especially of the move to, say, Vietnam, is also driven by China and China's w increases in wages and the cost of production. So some of that might, uh, might still stay. Parallel to the trade war, we have seen that many scholars are worried about an escalation towards a currency war. We have seen that from the Chinese part, they have been depreciating the renminbi very aggressively into numbers that we had only seen at 2008. Can China win in a currency war in a dollar-denominated world? Okay, so that there's actually three questions in there, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and, the, and they're all and they're all very good and, and, and very deep. Uh, so, so firstly, when it comes to China and the renminbi, so the Chinese renminbi has moved to becoming a more flexible exchange rate, right? So what happens with its exchange rate movements reflects market pressures, uh, and even the current depreciation that we saw, the most recent one, is a reflection of trade, uh, trade tensions. Uh, so then to the question of currency wars. I think, uh, I mean, this has been a perennial uh, concern uh, since, you know, since the birth of the international monetary system, which is people have the sense that tariffs and weaker currencies or stronger currencies have, have something very similar, right? Which is the fact that uh, if I'm importing goods from another country uh, and that country's currency depreciates, then it's as if that country has an export subsidy or then they are able to sell to me much more cheaply, right? Uh, on the other hand, so how would I respond to that? I could respond to that by putting a tariff on them uh, to, to countervail that particular uh, currency movement. So there's a sense in which currencies and tariffs work very similarly. The truth is that in, in reality, they don't. Yeah. Uh, they re if you look at actually how exports and imports respond to tariffs versus how they respond to exchange rate movements, those two are, are uh, quite different. Uh, and let me give you a simple example. If I think of from the current episode, uh, if you look at between the U.S. and China, so the U.S. and China, U.S. imposed around 10% average tariffs on goods coming from China. But at the same time over this period, the U.S. dollar has appreciated by around 10% relative to the renminbi. So if the two were equivalent, you would have said, well, 10% higher tariffs, but the 10% stronger currency, maybe they would offset each other. But that hasn't been the case. You've actually seen U.S. importers are actually paying uh, the full, full cost of the tariff. So there is a, there is a sense in which uh, as long as you have a currency, as long as monetary policy is in action, you're going to get currency movements or even any other market forces are going to generate currency movements. There is going to be the concern about whether given that there is insufficient demand in the world, are we actually seeing people trying to steal demand from different parts of the world? I mean, I would just say two things to it. One, the exchange rate moves around for many, many different reasons, much not necessarily policy driven. Uh, and secondly, the link between exchange rate movements and the trade balance in the short run uh, can be, you know, while it exists, can be relatively muted. You mentioned that this has been a conversation that has basically been since the beginning of uh, this sort of new era in the currency uh, around the world. Do you think that the inclusion of other currencies at, as trade currencies would mitigate the effects of, of, of this sort of um, play? Yep. So, so, yeah, so, you know, it's what you uh, said earlier, which is that we live in a world of what we call dollar dominance, which is that if you look at the, the amount the dollar gets used in international trade, it's way outsized relative to the, dollar, to the U.S.'s role in international trade, which means that there's a whole lot of trade that gets, takes place between, say, Canada and China, which is, which is in dollars, uh, and be in between countries that don't, that don't use the dollar as their own currency. Now, the question is, what would happen if we move to something else? And the first thing we have to recognize is that historically, it has almost always been the case that there is one currency that dominates. So it was a British pound before the First World War. Uh, and now, more recently, it's the dollar. So there are forces that tend to make one currency more important than other currencies in the world. Such right? as? Uh, which a strong network effect, which is, take the f uh, simple example, which is that most exporters are also importers, right? Which means that if everything I buy from, from the rest of the world is priced in dollars, 
that gives me a reason to also price uh, in dollars because of these network effects, right? To align my costs and my revenues, I have a tendency to price in, uh, in dollars. Uh, similarly, you can see how the, the, you know, the dollar is also one of the biggest international funding currencies, which is countries borrow externally in terms of dollars. That also reinforces the dollar's role in, in, other, for, in other spaces. Well, that said, I think we certainly can see an argument for a little more balance in the international monetary system, even if it's not an equal sharing, a little more balance where you have uh, some other currencies. The big question is, which are these other currencies? Right now, the candidates would be the euro. Yeah. Uh, there's the renminbi that gets brought up, but I think that that's, we're talking about way in the future for that renminbi. So then the question is the euro, right? Why not the euro? Uh, what we've seen, if anything, is that the euro's role actually went down post the global financial crisis. So uh, the euro first came in 1999, it, uh, its share went up as a global currency, uh, and then it went down. Now the euro, you do see the euro being used a lot, but that's because there is a lot of intra-euro area trade. The euro does trade with many other countries in the world. But to become a truly global currency, it has to be that you know, when Canada trades with, say, China, they start using the euro. Now, that we are not seeing at this point, right? Now, why is that? I mean, why, how do we get the, the euro to become a more global currency? There are many factors, and I can go into this, but for me, the number one factor is, uh, even now, there is uh, a survey that run around the world, which surveys individuals and institutional investors, which asks the question that what is the probability of the breakup of euro, right? Uh, and at this point, so during the peak of the, of the global financial crisis, 2012, that probability was at 70%, now it's at 10%. Now, if you're going to be a global currency, yeah, that's quite some there, change. <laughs> there should be no state of the world yeah. where people question the existence of, of the euro, right? And I, so I think the point to make is that, uh, you know, there has to be continued reform in the euro area, there has to be structural reform, union-wide reform in the form of capital union, banking union, uh, a common fiscal capacity, uh, national reforms, but reforms that basically improve the resilience of the euro area. So that the next time there's a crisis, and which there will be, because that's how the world economy works, that there's never a question about whether the euro will be around. Well, speaking about the next crisis, over the summer we saw an inversion in the yield curve of U.S. Treasury bonds. And we have already spoken about perhaps some of the causes for this, namely the U.S.-China trade war, but some governors at the Federal Reserve have said that really the inversion is due to domestic issues in the U.S. economy. Uh, what do you think would be the real cause behind the inversion in the U.S. Uh, yield curve? Yes, so that uh, people pay a lot of attention to it because it has a good reputation for signaling a recession, not immediately, but you know, in a 36 months uh, a period of time. Uh, so the question, and every time people think that may maybe this time also that same thing would happen. Uh, well, I do think that, you know, that does signal some, some concern because after all, what it tells you when you have an inversion of the yield curve is that term premiums are very low, uh, which means that there is a tremendous appetite for safe assets, which is usually associated when people are becoming more nervous about the future. But this time is a bit different, right? Why? So in the past, whenever the, turf, the yield curve is inverted, the problem has been that there was too much inflation and central banks were raising interest rates. And so it's usually the short end of the yield curve that goes up and you get the, get the inversion. Now we're in a situation where inflation is, if anything, below target for most central banks and interest rates are very low. So that's not the source of the inversion. The inversion is coming from what's happening uh, at the long end. Uh, and What's different is that when you're in a world with very low inflation and people don't expect inflation coming up, term premiums are going to be small. Because yeah. if there's no risk of inflation, there's going to be a low risk of that. So that itself is keeping the term premium low. That's one. Interest rates are extremely low going forward. Uh, we've had a huge amount of quantitative easing, which means that there's been a lot of purchases of long-term uh, assets. So all of that has its own separate channel. And so in that sense, this time could be a little different. So is it possible that perhaps by the end of next year, 2020, the United States will be in a recession? That's not in our baseline, but as of now. As of now, <laughs> but it is possible that in, 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 in the future, as you said, there will be another crisis. The, yes, the, there, I think that 
if you ask me the question, is there a probability of a crisis uh, in the future, <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With 100%. Yes. But it's already interesting to see central bankers around the world. I mean, last week we had here in the European Central Bank, um, central bankers are pursuing an expansionary monetary policy to address some of the sort of downside risks we've been discussing here today. Mm -hmm. Do you think this expansionary monetary policy is helping to prolong uh, sort of the boom in our economy that we're witnessing right now, or, or even to say differently, preventing the next crisis? I believe it is. Uh, there are serious downside risks to the global economy, uh, and again, the trade tensions are an important part of that. Uh, I, what the accommodative monetary policy has done is to maintain accommodative financial conditions in the world. Uh, and which gives you a sense that these downside risks seem less likely at this point. Uh, but that said, I th and I think this is important to acknowledge, is that monetary policy cannot be the only game in town, uh, which means that to, to, to be able to keep growth up in the global economy, it is important to have policy certainty. People should have a good sense of what the rules of engagement are and in a very permanent way. Uh, so, so those things are really first, first order and quite important. And then there are some countries that we believe have the fiscal space, live in an environment where they're borrowing at negative interest rates, uh, which gives you a good reason to undertake spending now, not in a stimulated demand necessarily kind of way, but just in terms of raising potential growth. Uh, it's very interesting what you mentioned because in the World Auto Report, there were many, many uh, arguments in favor of this expansion in the fiscal side, but one expansion that would uh, uh, be very aware of the consolidating needs of each country. Um, our question to you is, how, does, how do those policies actually look like? Because what are policies that at the one hand also help you consolidate, but also promote long-term growth? So again, so, so I mean, to the, uh, to the question on fiscal policy, it's going to be country dependent, right? So there are, there are some countries where we don't think fiscal consolidation is needed. Uh, Germany would be an example of that. Uh, and in that particular case, it's a, it's a good example of there are needs for uh, spending on infrastructure, you know, R&D, innovation, human capital. A and again, when you are in an environment with very low interest rates, negative interest rates, from a pure cost-benefit analysis. So it can be completely non-Keynesian. I mean, you, you might not think that you have, a, you have a negative output gap. But just from a cost-benefit analysis, there could be an argument to do it uh, now as opposed to doing it uh, in the future. Now, for countries when, uh, where you have fiscal consolidation uh, concerns, uh, again, low interest rates environment certainly gives you some more space than in the past when you would be having very high interest rates and then it would be uh, much harder to, uh, to be, you know, uh, fiscally accommodative. So the idea about fiscal consolidation would be kind of trading off what you do in the short term with what you're promising to do over the medium term uh, to the long term. So the idea would be right now that your short term policies are accommodative for growth, but your medium term to long term policies are more about towards consolidation. As you mentioned, we live in a in a very sort of low yield, low interest rate world nowadays. But does this cons does this is there any concern to have about this constraining our ability to address the next recession? It's certainly the case that monetary policy is, uh, you know, not in, in the tools that they have right now are limited than what they had at the start of the previous uh, financial crisis in so 2008. Most major central banks' interest rates are close to uh, zero, some neg negative, as in the, in the case of the ECB. Uh, there's been a plenty of quant quantity easing that's happened. The question is how much more can be done. So the toolkit is certainly uh, limited. And, which is and the challenge is, of course, that despite all of these policies that have been put in place, inflation seems stubbornly below, below target. Uh, and so this is clearly triggering a discussion uh, among central bankers, which is that if we live in a world where inflation remains below 2%, then are we going to be in the situation where we're always struggling with very little uh, policy space available? Uh, and so then I think there is a very important discussion to be had about how do we raise inflation expectations in the world. I mean, it's interesting because the, 
the current monetary policy frameworks that we have were designed at the time when the problem was high inflation. And so we were very successful in bringing down uh, inflation in a very durable, permanent way. But now we have maybe something of an opposite problem, which is where inflation expectations are anchored at such low levels that it's, it is constraining what monetary policy can do. Right. Well, um, thank you for your answers. Now we'd like to open up the room for an, uh, two audience questions. If there are any uh, questions in the audience about what we've been discussing, the global economy, please raise your hands. Uh, yes, the lady here in the front. Sorry, could you wait for the microphone? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you've been talking a lot about the impact of the dollar on the global economy. Um, what will be on our minds, of course, is the issue of Brexit. Do you have any predictions about the um, consequence on the global economy concerning the pound? As in, do you have any predictions on how the pound will change? or what Brexit will do to the global GDP, as far as you can say as of now, because it's very uncertain still? So, uh, I mean, indeed, Brexit is, again, one of those downside risks that we've been flagging. It is, again, in the, in the umbrella of policy uncertainty about where what the world will look like. We don't know what the exact form or shape it will take. Uh, the details of what the impact is going to be, of course, depends upon the details of what the final agreement looks like. But we've run some estimates of an outcome of no deal, what we call no deal Brexit, where the UK basically lapses to WTO rules and with respect to trade. So you no longer have a free trade area. In that situation, our uh, estimate is that it would reduce UK's GDP in the long run by about 5%, so 5 to 6%, so it's quite significant. Now, the rest of the uh, EU, it's a much smaller impact. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at particular countries, Ireland, of course, is much more impacted than, than other countries are. And the global impact as such may not be that big, but that said, uh, one of the things you always worry about is when things go in unexpected ways that that usually can generate a change in financial market sentiment, and then that can have much stronger effects through the global economy. So, uh, so, there, so that's where we are. Uh, with respect to the pound, you've already seen what's happened to the pound. In fact, there's one variable that reacts very quickly every time there's news of a no-deal Brexit, possibility of a no-deal Brexit, you see the pound uh, depreciating, which of course then has consequences for uh, inflation in the UK. Uh, which is one of the countries in the world, actually, where inflation is above or slightly, uh, uh, definitely at target. So that's not an issue over there. Uh, and you've certainly seen investment uh, decline. So this uncertainty about Brexit uh, has led to a, uh, uh, a decline in investment, not a decline as in a fall in investment, but weaker investment growth in the UK, which tells you that, you know, kicking the can down the road also doesn't exactly get to get it solve the problem. You really need a solution to it, uh, uh, you know, sooner than later. Thank you for that audience questions. Are there any more? Yes, the gentleman in the back. Could you yes, please sir. raise your hand? Yeah. Press the button. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, well, thank you for uh, everything today, uh, first of all. And actually, like, uh, as we've discussed, like, uh, there are some issues with the, of course, uh, trade wars and I its effects to the global economy. But maybe we need to be, uh, while, uh, as we're living in the Netherlands here, like, and we need to be more worried about its effects on uh, the Eurozone. Uh, so. Uh, well, uh, while it has effects on China and U.S. direct effects, it has indirect effects to European economy as well. And um, while uh, also there are other topics of uh, trade deal discussions between Euros, Eurozone and U.S. again, based on like uh, examples of automobiles and tariffs on the other things. Uh, and um, also there are other issues as uh, well, like if some countries have all the yield curves in negative 
places like Germany. And I think they also had like a negative growth in the previous quarters. And um, well, also ECB, as we've seen, uh, is in the negative rates and 10 basis points in the f past few weeks. They also decreased and opened the new QE program for infinite future. Um, and like when I looked, um, looked at them all, and we have the, of course, inflation pl problem. When I looked at them all, um, I see it. Um, I mean, I see that we have more problems than U.S. to discuss with. So how do you see the outlook of Eurozone uh, in the future and um, uh, the ECB's potential, probably implications, as also IMF is going to a leadership change uh, and its leader is starting to be, I mean, he's going to be the president of the ECB. Um, how do you see ECB's actions and the Eurozone, Eurozone outlook? Okay, how much time do we have for this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there, was a, there was a lot in that question. Thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> so I think we should just answer maybe what is the outlook of the Eurozone in particular, yeah. Yeah, also yeah, considering the ECB. So, ju so just um, very quickly, like I said, the, what the, if you look at what's happening in the world economy in terms of economic activity, you s the, we're seeing weaknesses in manufacturing. Anybody, any country that is more manufacturing dependent, more trade dependent, is going to be more affected by what's going on in the world economy as opposed to the other countries that are much more reliant on services, uh, you know, services, that's on the service sector. So which is why if you look at Germany, Germany is being hit more by the trade tensions between US and China than uh, some other countries in the Euro area would be. Now there is weakness in the Euro area uh, in terms of the growth rate. I mean, if you look at, of course, individual countries, there is a lot of heterogeneity. Unemployment rates in many countries are close to pre-crisis level. So there has, you know, th there, is, there is health there. Uh, but it is struggling with low productivity growth, aging demographics. And so there are some medium-term issues in the Euro area that need to be addressed. As for the near term and in terms of ECB policies, I mean, it is related to what I said earlier, which is that when there is a risk of inflation expectations getting de-anchored, there is an argument to be made to have more monetary policy stimulus, which is what uh, the ECB is doing. Perfect. Thank you very much for your question. We're going to now move on into uh, discussing the role of the IMF and okay. seeing how the IMF is going to look in the future. When we read a lot of your reports, when we listen to interviews with Madame Lagarde, for example, there's always these things that keeps popping up, and that is that the IMF has to be ready for the next recession. Yet, most of these discussions seem a bit vague. So, what specifically should the IMF change in order to be ready for the next recession? I, I mean, I would put it more as the world needs to be prepared for the, for the next recession. I mean, what the IMF does is pr three roles. Yeah. Uh, we do surveillance, which is we look at countries and see how they're doing. We, uh, the second thing we do is financing, which is that when countries are in, in trouble, we are in some sense a lender of last resort. And the third we do is uh, capacity development, which is helping countries build institutions uh, that help their macroeconomy better, so better tax institutions, better, uh, you know, dealing, how do you deal with corruption, how do you deal with terrorist financing, I mean, there are many issues, better monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, all of those aspects. Uh, and I think the idea of, of preparing for the future, which would be the case at, at, at pretty much any point in time, is, would be on all three fronts, which is to make sure that the IMF has all the resources it needs to be able to effectively finance needs of countries that are in recession. So, so should we aim at an increase in the budget of the IMF? Should that make the, the work of the IMF easier? Right, of course, this is, this, <laughs> this, is a dis this is to be decided by the member countries yeah. and above my pay grade. <laughs> um, but you know, at, at this point, the IMF is adequately resourced. We can make about a trillion dollars of loans. Uh, right now we have 36 programs with countries. Uh, but it is important that there is such an institution that is able to perform uh, uh, the lender of last resort role. Uh, and of course, I think our other big role is in paying very close attention to what's developing the world economy and in terms of uh, coming up with policy recommendations of what countries should be doing, what they can plan to do uh, 
uh, going forward if and when there is a, a recession? Much of the criticism that the IMF uh, usually receives comes from their adjustment, uh, sorry, structural adjustment programs. And most of those critiques go in the lines of uh, some sort of neglectance to the social reality that is present in the countries which take the loans from the IMF. How does the IMF react to this sort of criticism? So I think it's important first to step back and recognize that, uh, you know, the usually when the IMF goes in, it is a situation when a country is in crisis. Uh, when, in the absence of the IMF, the, the country would not be able to finance the spending that it needs because nobody else is willing to lend to them. So we uh, play what we call a shock absorber role, uh, which is to go in when countries need financing and markets aren't providing that at, at a reasonable rate. And usually when the IMF goes in, it catalyzes other uh, investors to also go in because there is a, usually an economic program that the country themselves uh, decide to adopt that goes along with it. Now again, when you are going in and there are finan financing constraints, obviously by construction, something has to give, right? Some, some spending has to be impacted by it. I mean, I'd like to think that the fund is actually doing paying close attention to social vulnerabilities. Uh, if you look at, you know, the, if you look at the re programs that have been rolled out very recently, uh, there has been focus on preserving expenditure on the fiscal side that's targeted at low-income uh, households. So there is attention paid to that. But again, it's always a challenge. I mean, there will, there, it is a tough situation that countries are in, and as you know, the world economy is unpredictable. Shocks can arise from many places, uh, and that can always complicate things. Let me, jump on th let me jump in that uh, notion of shocks and, 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 and uncertainty, because I think that you mentioned the fiscal part of it, that um, the IMF has been trying to guard some of the fiscal sensitive uh, entities from countries. But what has been the work from the IMF when it comes to capital? Because we have seen that, especially as you mentioned before, in emerging markets, um, one of their vulnerabilities is those sort of uh, capital outflows, capital inflows. Um, how can, what has the IMF done to sort of correct or help or sort of mitigate the vulnerabilities in some of these countries you're helping and suffer from these sort of uh, problems? Uh, so, so this, of course, is unrelated to program assistance, right? Yeah. This is just more generally uh, the concern about uh, a typical emerging market that it is absolutely true in the world that we live in that they can get buffeted by changes in financial market sentiment in, uh, in the rest of the but world. One, one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, famous um, advices the IMF gave was sort of that openness to capital markets. So that my question comes more from that direction. Um, what, what has the IMF uh, done to address? Ye yes, so uh, there's actually been, I, in my opinion, there's actually been a significant change in uh, the IMF's views on, on, on capital flows. So I think if you go way back in the past, it was the case that ca full capital account liberalization without any controls would be the first best thing. The assumption, of course, is that countries have expenditures they need to undertake, they need to undertake investment, they need financing, capital can do that financing. But we've, we have seen that, of course, with this comes lots of risks, the kind you mentioned. Uh, and there's been an acknowledgement of that, uh, which is why, if you look at the, the current advice that you have, uh, you can see that you know, one of the things that the, uh, that the IMF pushes for is just that countries en encourage foreign direct investment, not necessarily portfolio short-term flows. So the nature of capital flows matter. Uh, there is an allowance for using capital flow measures in the case of you know, market tantrums. So all of this is quite a change from before. And I, I just want to flag this as marketing, which is that we're actually working on what we call the integrated policy framework now at the IMF, which is precisely uh, to look at what kinds of tools countries can use, which include monetary policy, exchange rate intervention, capital flow policies, and uh, macroprudential policies, and how to optimally use that to deal with capital flow shocks. What, what is the major urgency coming from the macro potential part that the IMF has flagged? No, I, I mean, I think the point is a recognition that there when, it, given, the, given the vulnerabilities that these countries face, uh, that 
you know, tools have to be in place that they can use. Now, it's, it's not obvious that you should use it all the time. You should absolutely, that doesn't, may not be the case. We have to still figure out when and when to use it. Uh, but to simply rule it out, ex ante, seems, uh, seems extreme. Emergency exit, we hope. <laughs> um, coming back to, to, to the critiques that the IMF has received, um, if we look at current uh, programs, I think the elephant in the room is Argentina. Um, how does the IMF deal with the criticisms that they have received from the Argentina case? So again, uh, in the case of Argentina, very similar to what I said before, which is that when we went in, so this was early part of 2018, uh, Argentina was, you know, had a serious drought. That was one problem. And then there was market, uh, international market tensions, which was causing the peso to depreciate by a lot. Uh, and that's when uh, we went and had a, an engagement with, uh, with Argentina's authorities. And so again, these are, these are challenging times. The goal always is to bring some stability in. Uh, I believe the program helped with, you know, reducing the current account deficit, the fiscal deficit. In that sense, it, it had uh, some success. What remained stubborn was inflation, the pass through from exchange rate depreciation into inflation. Uh, and, you know, as our former MD uh, Lagarde said in June, that that, I think it's absolutely clear that that is a cha was a challenge that, that uh, you know, turned out to be more serious than, than we might have expected it to be. So that is an issue. Now, of course, the, the environment keeps changing. Uh, we were, I think it was a, always a, a, a risk of what would happen on the political front, uh, the political uncertainty associated with it, and then the market uh, reactions to that. Uh, and so that's the situation right now. Uh, but we continue to work with, with, our, with Argentina and Argentinian authorities. Uh, and, you know, our goal is for macro stability and growth in Argentina. So returning to our previous conversation on currencies and the influence of the dollar in our world, I think one of the ways in which um, some individuals have thought about addressing the problem, such as Mark Carney, uh, the, bank, uh, the governor of the Bank of England, is by suggesting that the IMF should take charge or lead in creating an international electronic currency to help sort of dilute the impacts of a dollar-denominated world. What do you think of these kinds of proposals? I mean, I'd actually really like to hear what Mark Carney has to say about <laughs> that in, in, uh, in some more detail. Uh, he, he put that out without, without a plan. I'm sure he has one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think th the issue that he brought up was, is, is genuine and is sanguine, which is that uh, we certainly are in a world where because of uh, dollar dominance, we have a phenomenon where you know, financial sentiment in the US transmits much more quickly, US monetary policy transmits much more quickly to the rest of the world. We have a situation where countries, especially small open economies, emerging markets, have a fear of floating because they don't want their currency to depreciate too much relative to the dollar, the effect on inflation. Uh, and so the question is how do, uh, how do we deal with it? Uh, uh, and again, I think there is an argument to be made to have a more balanced uh, uh, set of currencies as opposed to just one. There, there's lots of reasons for that, um, including the fact that there's such a high demand for, for safe assets, and especially dollar safe assets, it would help if the rest of the world were also a source of supply of safe assets. So you can think about an argument for it. Now the question is, how do you make that transition happen? And like I've said, historically, you haven't had, you know, you haven't typically had multiple currencies at the same time. There have been periods when that's been the case, but not, not more generally. Um, the details of what the IMF can do, I think, this is, I think this is going 10 steps ahead because we have to first ask the question of what exactly would a synthetic hegemon currency look like because that would require a lot of coordination across central banks. Uh, and that is, you know, hard to envisage at this point. So there are many steps before we can get there. Uh, uh, but, I, but I think that these are important questions to be raised and I think it will keep coming up. Because with fintech, with uh, big tech firms proposing their own payment systems yeah, and Facebook, their own currencies, Facebook, uh, that is a real issue. 
right? Which is um, how do you, how do you, how should central banks be responding to digital currencies that are being put out by the private sector? So that will uh, will come up. And you know, while cryptocurrencies have been around now for a little while, and we've had Bitcoin, uh, I think the situation now is a bit different. The the what you're what we're seeing out there is a bit different because, well, if I think of something like Bitcoin, what exactly is it satisfying? Satisfying the demand of some speculators for some very high yield investments. So it's mostly speculative investors who are in, in, interested in a currency like that. But when you think of you know big tech stable coins, uh, that's about really about payments. It's about addressing a demand for using the currency for transaction purposes, and that's the fundamental piece of how a currency comes into birth. Yes. Uh, and that's why I think uh, the potential for disruption is bigger and the reason why central banks around the world are paying closer attention. To this the proposal. Yeah. Now I want to turn the conversation more to sort of the, the IMF's role in sort of our globe nowadays, especially the kind of geopolitical environment we're in, which is we see a lot of populist figures coming up and pushing for a more isolated, more divided globe. But the IMF has always been an institution pushing for increased international cooperation and multilateralism. How do you see the IMF's role in this light developing as we see more populist figures coming to power? So I mean, I, I'll make a few points here, which is first to recognize that multilateralism, international cooperation, has delivered a lot of benefits to the world economy. Uh, global trade has been good for growth in the world. It's been good for reducing poverty in some parts of the world. At the same time, of course, one recognizes that along with it has come concerns like inequality, some people benefiting a lot more than the others. And this is not surprising to economists. This is what we would expect. The expectation was that domestic policies <coughs> would address these uh, these inequalities, and that's I don't, and we didn't see enough of that happen, and that was the, that was the problem giving rise to the current uh, populist uh, sentiment. Now, as for the IMF, and the IMF has it been an evolving institution, and we've changed many times. So, if you think of the birth of the IMF, it was to maintain a fixed exchange rate system relative to the dollar and the dollar relative to the gold, gold, right? Yes. We're not there anymore. Oh, We're now yeah. in a world <laughs> with floating exchange rates. Yeah. Uh, and we still have a very important role. So I think it is, it's, it, as the world evolves, as the monetary system evolves, uh, this, you know, the IMF evolves along with it. But I, I think it, we have to continue to emphasize the need for global cooperation and multilateralism because there are big issues out there, like climate, uh, which cannot be addressed at the national level just by construction. And it has to be an international issue. There is questions of international taxation, uh, cybersecurity. All of these issues, I think, require multilateralism. And I think that it would be the, I mean, it's not, in some sense, it's not surprising that people start questioning the current institutions that we have, right? Including the current rules of the game for international trade. People will question it. That's, I mean, these, nothing stays static forever. Uh, but I think we need to, realize that that doesn't mean throwing out the whole system, but improving it. Yeah. We also see that sort of, as you've described, the current, we see that the current international financial system is starting to change with the rise of new institutions such as the Asian Investment Infrastructural Bank, sort of these other institutions that provide loans to sovereign states. Going into the future, does the IMF see itself in competition with these parallel institutions or partnering up with these institutions? No, we certainly see them as complementing what the, okay. what the IMF does. I think the, the world needs a bigger safety net. You know, other uh, institutions provide uh, some of that role. There is a big need for infrastructure spending in the world, other sources of financing help. So I think this is a cooperative game. Do you think that given that there is now a larger market then for, for loans in that sense, can we fear a run to the bottom when it comes to the standards that are backed with these loans? I, when it comes to this sort of like um, other alternatives for the IMF when it comes to financing? Well, I mean, the, the, so this then is up to the international community to make sure that that is not the case. 
usually when you start lending indiscriminately, it's even bad for the creditor because you might end up with high levels of default and other problems. Uh, and so there is an incentive for the country too to be, to more, be, be more prudent about it. Uh, but again, this is again a part of the international community to set some standards for the kinds of investments that get done. Thank you. Uh, we are almost at the end of our interview, but before we end, we would like to ask for some more questions from our audience. Uh, this gentleman here at the front, could you keep your hand raised so our microphone can find you? Thank you. Also, could you please stand up so we can see you? Yeah, thank you very much, first. Um, earlier this year, I'm talking about Argentina, sorry. Earlier this year, after the good stabilization of inflation expectations, the central bank had some space to lower interest rates, which were above 70% nominal. Uh, they didn't do mainly because, mainly due to a fear of dollarization of portfolios, which could uh, have a huge impact on exchange rate and pass through through, through inflation. Um, and well, my question is that besides the impact of economic activity of the interest rate of high interest rates, there is some literature, some current that states that high interest rate have permanently high interest rate have high like raise inflation in the long term because of expectations mainly. Don't you think that the central bank could have um, take advantage of this calm that they had in the second quarter of this year to lower interest rates and support the pressure on the portfolio with its own reserves instead of keeping the interest rates high? That's, that's the main question. Uh, so the question is never as, as simple as it seems, and the answer is never as simple. When, we, when we're thinking about policy, you can't just think about the current conjuncture at the moment about the way things look, but you also have to look at what you expect might happen in the future, the risks that might build up uh, in the future. I mean, to your question of do we get something like the Fisher effect, which is that when interest rates go up, you actually get higher inflation because of those inflation expectations. I mean, empirically, <coughs> there is no there is no evidence of that. I mean, it's hard to, to make that case from the data. I mean, in the case of Argentina, I believe the, the phenomenon that we've seen is a very high pass-through of exchange rate uh, depreciation to inflation, which tells you that inflation expectations clearly seem to depend a lot on what's happening with the peso. Uh, and what we did see over the past year, while we did see uh, uh, you know, high interest rates, fiscal deficits coming down, current account deficits coming down. It was certainly the case that the currency was much more volatile and the pass through to inflation was high. Now, there are other pieces to it, which is there is how wages get set in Argentina, which is also another factor. So there are many forces in there that generated inflation inertia. Thank you. We also still have time for one more question. So the gentleman in the blue jacket there. Um, okay, um, so in the past, uh, our currency was always set to the gold standard. And I was actually thinking, what's your opinion on how it could look like in the future? Maybe like if countries should go back to the gold standard or maybe find something new as a standard instead of uh, with the current exchange rates. How would I, what's your yeah, outlook on it? If the, maybe in the future countries go, would go back to the gold standard maybe or something like it. So, so the gold standard obviously collapsed, right? So. It wasn't a success story at the end of the day. There were, there were some people who still think well of it. But the bottom line is that if you believe uh, monetary policy and independent monetary policy and flexible monetary policy has a role to play, then it's hard to think of a return going back to the gold standard where you're gonna tie your hands and prices of gold are gonna have a big effect on your policy. So I don't see that as being a, a real issue. I mean, again, I think I, I would I want to end with something on the positive side, which is that because there's been, with the greater independence of central banks around the world, uh, you've, with more inflation targeting, you've certainly seen much more well-behaved inflation in different parts of the world. 
Uh, and even for emerging markets, previously, if you would have big appreciations and depreciations, this is with the exception of some countries, but for a lot of countries that previously, whenever their exchange rates moved around, the pass through to inflation was very high. We've seen much less of that. Uh, so countries are now actually better able to deal with external shocks. Uh, and that's something that we should, we should keep in mind before throwing any system out. I wanted to follow up on your answer there because you're, you mentioned the independence of our monetary policy. But as we've seen in, in the recent year, certain central banks are coming under th attacks from politicians, namely the United States, Mr. Trump attacking uh, Powell at the Fed. Does this concern you that in the future we may see less independent central banks or is this just uh, something we shouldn't really worry about? It's, it's very hard to speculate about the future, but I mean, the point we've always made is central bank independence. And by that, I mean operational independence, which is deciding what interest rates are set. Uh, that is very important for the health of, uh, of any currency uh, and for the health of the economy. Thank you very much for your question. Um, sadly, we're moving into the end of the interview, but before we end, we have discussed a very lengthy amount of topics today and I would like to um, close it up with a summarizing question and it's good that the gold has been uh, uh, talked about pretty often because our question to you is should we, be, should we be worried about the next recession right now? Should we start hoarding gold <laughs> or <laughs> is there other kind of um, hope or silver, silver line for us in the future? Okay, so in general hoarding gold I'm not sure is a good <laughs> idea but uh, to the question of uh, recession, is it around the corner? Uh, is it imminent? Uh, our view is that it's not in our baseline for either 2019 or for 2020, right? So we don't think a recession is imminent at this point. Um, and the reason we don't think so is because services sectors around the world, and for most major economies, the services sector is their main driver of economic activity, uh, is holding up quite well. We're seeing wage growth. We're seeing real wage growth. We're seeing very low unemployment rates. Uh, so there are indicators that give you uh, the sense that economic activity is holding up, though it's, it's slowing down. Now, again, there are downside risks. We are, you know, our most recent numbers of 2019 is 3.2% and 2020 is 3.5% growth. Well, so, and it's been, it's been downgraded, which means that there's not that much space to, ha to be able to deal with additional negative shocks. So any more trade tensions that build up with, say, the US and the, U and the EU, or uh, a no deal Brexit, um, any of those kinds of uh, events can change the course of the, of the global economy. Thank you. Unfortunately, that has to conclude our interview. But before we give a warm round of applause to our guests, we have two announcements to make. Firstly, Room for Discussion, as you may have seen, is recruiting, looking for new interviewers. So if you would like the opportunity to interview guests such as Professor Gopinath on our stage, please consider applying before the September 27th. Also, join us tomorrow for our session on EU-China. We will have our interviewers, Alex and Ungan, conducting an interview on Chinese investments in the European Union. But for now, please give a warm round of applause for our guest, Professor Gopinath. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.